Hi, my name is Mark Couturier. I'm a medical director at ARUP Laboratories for Infectious Disease and Immunology. Today we're going to discuss uh, molecular detection methods for detecting gastrointestinal pathogens. So acute diarrheal illnesses are a significant cause of both morbidity and mortality. This is true in the United States, but much more so in developing countries. The primary focus for these illnesses is to prevent the uh, dehydration to occur to begin with, and if dehydration does occur, to provide adequate and immediate rehydration. In the U.S., we know that most GI infections are not intervened or uh, consulted by a medical professional. And that could be for various reasons, either because symptoms resolve so quickly or uh, the delay in being able to get in to see a provider. But the CDC estimates, based on what is reported, that there are likely over 350 million acute cases of GI illness each year. If we look at the FoodNet reports, and FoodNet is the network that reports foodborne illnesses, so these are specifically GI illnesses that are linked to a specific contaminated food product, uh, there are 48 million cases. So roughly uh, one-fifth of our cases are directly linked to the food that we are buying at the grocery store. So when we think about GI pathogens, what are we routinely testing for? Well, if we look at physicians ordering practices, Bacteria are by and large the number one assayed group of pathogens, followed by parasites and, uh, and a distant third of the viruses. But in reality, the prevalence of what's actually causing these GI illnesses is at least 60% by viruses, um, and a smaller fraction, perhaps 20% bacteria and uh, 15 to 20% parasites. So some of the things we know, again, viruses, they're the most prevalent, but they're the least tested, as we just saw. And in fact, norovirus is the number one GI infection across the United States, typically associated with outbreaks, um, but can also be sporadic. As far as the bacteria are concerned, we know stool culture is the most used test in the clinical lab, though the uh, return on investment is quite low in that anywhere between 1% to 5% of specimens are actually positive, and that's you know, geographically dependent as well as method dependent. For parasites, we know the Oven parasite exam is probably one of the most overused tests in clinical pathology, and it's also misused. Uh, but despite that, there is a bit of a predictive ability to know when parasite testing makes sense. Uh, for instance, for domestically acquired infections, there's typically an association with a known exposure, such as cryptosporidium, we think about contaminated water supplies or swimming pools. Cyclospora, we think about cluster uh, diarrhea associated with a common produce source, uh, etc. So how can molecular testing for pathogens help? Well, if we multiplex our targets, which means basically putting multiple targets into one assay, we can try to get over some of the hurdles that we see. Some of these hurdles are that the syndromes are just too similar for physicians to practically separate out and be able to predict I think this is Campylobacter versus I think this is uh, Chiardia. Also, we know that physicians have a difficult time ordering the tests in a consistent uh, standardized method. So we know that there's probably way too many stool cultures used. Uh, there's definitely way too many ONP exams. And there's pretty much no or you know very occasional viral testing. So the molecular tests can also give you faster turnaround time. Uh, analytically, they're more sensitive and more specific. And they can also help to reduce the burden on our laboratories, both as far as the amount of hands we have to do the test, um, reduce complexity of the testing. And so it may allow you to consolidate redundant tests that you might have. So you might have a Chiardia antigen, you might have ONP for Chiardia, and you can potentially reduce or get rid of these tests altogether. I'd like to go into the FDA cleared test methods for multiplex GI pathogens. Um, there are five currently on the market. The first is a Prodessa Progastro assay. This is an open platform that does bacteria only. It's a real-time PCR methodology that uses a separate off-board extraction on a uh, BioMiru Easy Mac and amplification on a Cepheid Smart Cycler. This assay detects Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, and the Shigatoxin producing E. coli which are also your uh, pathogens that you detect in a conventional stool culture. BD-MAX 
has enteric bacterial and, and parasitic panels. These are both two separate panels that can be run on the same instrument. This is an all-in-one platform. It's technically a walk-away system in that once you load the primary specimen, all subsequent steps are performed by the instrument. Uh, this includes the extraction and the amplification steps, and then the result output is done through the software. Parasitic panel includes Giardia, Cryptosporidium, and Entomibia stilitica, and the bacterial panel is the same as Prodessa. Scaling up to a more broader panel is the Veragene enteric pathogen test, and this detects both bacteria and viruses. So in addition to the bacteria detected by the other two manufacturers, they've also included Vibrio and Yersinia enterocolitica, as well as both norovirus and rotavirus. This test is done in a cartridge format. Uh, this, there's a real-time PCR hybridization to an array within this cartridge. Then there is a oligonucleotide uh, hybridization to gold particles, and that's actually a signal amplification done binding silver particles to the gold and then detecting by light scattering. So this is a slightly different methodology, but the same upfront idea of real-time PCR. And Veragene took the approach looking at what we talked about earlier, most infections are viral. So let's include viral targets. Most of the testing conventionally is for bacteria, so let's make sure we cover bacteria. And there's some in the field that feel that like this is maybe the sweet spot. Uh, however, the company is pursuing a broad panel, which will include parasites as well as some of the other uh, other targets in the bacterial and viral realm. But they're going to have an option to do what's termed a flex model, where you only pay for the analytes you test. So you would pre-select the targets on the panel, and those that you don't test would be reimbursed to you by the company. Going even broader, the Luminex XTAC GPP assay has a large collection of bacteria, additional virus over Veragene, as well as the three parasites seen on the PDMAX panel. This assay is essentially, again, an upfront multiplex PCR, and then uses proprietary primer extension using an XTAC system, which is uh, patented by Luminex, and hybridization to these patented XMAP beads. You can then get basically a cell sorting uh, with bead fluorescence to get an output of which analytes are detected. The last method is the film array GI panel. This has the broadest list of bacterial pathogens, viruses, and parasites. The film array uses uh, nested PCR. Again, all the steps are done within this pouch. Uh, nested PCR, and it has two stages of the PCR before an array uh, fluorescence detection in the final stage. This can currently be done on a single platform. Uh, seen in the lower left-hand corner, or in a uh, multi-modular tower, the, the torch, which was just recently FDA approved. Molecular testing definitely has a lot of benefits, um, so let's focus on a few of those now. So we can reduce our turnaround time because many of our cultures can take up to 72 hours to get your final identification. Uh, but just be aware, the turnaround time is method dependent, something like the film array, could take an hour and a half till you get all your resulting out. Something like the Luminex can potentially take eight to nine hours uh, for final reporting. All of these assays can effectively replace the stool cultures that are cumbersome and time consuming for the laboratory. Um, however, we do have to think about uh, the requirement of public health needing isolates. And so there still has to be some discussion as to whether you maintain backup cultures. Um, this can allow you to redirect and repurpose some of your FTEs if you take a lot of multiple manual methods and basically eliminate them or consolidate them. You have an ability to either not replace the retiring microbiologists that we're seeing, or maybe replace them with generalists in microbiology who can do these tests, but maybe also fill in in other parts of the micro lab. You can replace less sensitive tests. We know culture has limitations. We know antigen testing has limitations, and we definitely know that manual microscopy has limitations. We've seen through clinical trials and independent studies that for some of the challenging organisms for culture, namely Campylobacter, Shigatoxygenic E. coli, and some of the rare parasites like uh, Cyclospora, 
that the molecular methods can give you increased sensitivity. And then also some of these platforms can detect organisms that we didn't previously detect with our conventional methods. So I'd like to show you a couple case examples that and display the benefit of molecular testing. So in the left-hand column, we have a 72-year-old uh, female with a past medical history of colon cancer. She experienced several weeks of diarrhea. Typically, this came on after eating two to three loose stools a day. Uh, onset was in late June to early July 2015. She had explosive, loose, uh, high-volume diarrhea with preceding cramps. She had chills and sweats, but never documented a fever. She's from Utah. She never, uh, she had no travel history of recent and had not used previous antibiotics. So clostridium difficile, which would normally be higher on the differential for a woman in this age group, uh, was really not in the differential. She did document that she had concerns that all these symptoms started with a recent uh, super veggie salad diet that she had began. In the right hand column, we have a second patient. This is a 69 year old man who has past medical history of inflammatory bowel, bowel disease. And this is actually uh, 26 documented years. So this patient is fairly uh, used to having altered bowel activity and symptoms. But he experienced a six to seven week uh, history of diarrhea that was three to four watery stools per day in May to June 2015. But the patient really, you know, was keyed on this and said that it just seemed very different than his IBS. He had no reason to travel. He lives in Utah and he had not used antibiotics. So similar situation to patient one. His fecal lactoferrin, which is an inflammatory marker, uh, was positive, which you'd expect for someone with IBS. Fecal occult blood was negative, so no evidence of colitis or, th or bowel bleeding um, or in face of infections. And the CDF-PCR was negative. Both of these patients were ultimately diagnosed by multiplex PCR and AREP uh, with cyclosporic hyatinensis. And these were actually the first uh, cases from the 2015 national outbreak that you may have remembered uh, from August of that year. So there was actually a several month gap between when cases started being detected and when the final outbreak was announced. So in this case, neither physician suspected cyclospora, uh, but they suspected an endemic parasite, uh, more thinking more cryptosporidium or giardia. And that's why the GI parasite PCR was ordered. One physician, upon notification, was not familiar with cyclospora or even that it needed to be treated in complicated cases. Um, and likewise, neither physician would have ordered the modified acid fast stain in the prior years and neither clinic had previously ordered this stain. And this is a stain that's specifically needed to detect this organism. So previously, these infections in these clinics probably would not have been detected. And so we can think that in our setting, there's a potential for an unknown period of time that these infections were going silent. Now, these are the benefits that I've shown you, but there are some negatives. Capital expenditures are required. You need to buy instruments typically to run these tests. You can decide whether reagent rental contracts work for your laboratory or whether a straight up purchase is better. Um, those options generally both exist with IVD manufacturers. There have been some problems with billing and reimbursement. Um, those are evolving as CPT codes are established. And uh, some of the challenges come from, you know, the difference between inpatient ordering and outpatient ordering. There's also the situation where you're testing for multiple analytes when the physician has an extremely strong indication that there's one thing present. So the exposure was a swimming pool where children were documented as being in diapers. Um, that's, you know, pretty much a, a telltale sign for cryptosporidium. So does the patient really need to be tested for a slew of bacteria that they would get typically from food poisoning? Like the other side of the coin would be a parasite. Do you expect that in a patient who's been in a long-term cancer ward for greater than a month, they really shouldn't have been exposed to parasites while inpatient. So can you justify billing for those targets? Another uh, negative is you may detect organisms that actually aren't causing the acute insult. So for instance, 
norovirus and salmonella, both we know can shed for prolonged periods of time uh, in excess of a month, as well as Clostridium difficile, many people could be asymptomatically colonized in the community, but you could still detect it. Uh, detecting a lot of these organisms too can cause more calls to the lab, so the lab has to be prepared for one, who's going to field these calls, who's going to consult on them, and how, uh, what kind of call coverage is going to be available for these. Furthermore, these tests may not allow culture uh, for the bacterial targets if antibiotic susceptibility is requested, or for trying to establish outbreak investigations if there's no isolates. So I think the, the important point here is that not every patient necessarily needs this test. So the lab has to do its part to steward education to the providers on who is appropriate to get this. Um, every patient can't just get the test like we've done with, say, ONP. Uh, we've done this with ONP, we've done this with culture, because, begrudgingly and against our will. Often the, you know, the, the fighting point has been they're inexpensive tests, so it's probably not that big a deal. In this case, these are expensive tests. Every patient does not need them. And there are going to be some upset patients if they get a big bill where really they didn't need it. Uh, one approach to the cost is to list the price of the test in the CPOE so the physicians can actually see that. So they may think, wow, that's going to cost the patient this much. They're probably going to get better anyway. Do I really need this test? Um, and along that lines, the physician then has to think, do they really need this test? Because is it really going to alter what I'm going to do? If you have a totally healthy patient and the physician's instinct is, if it's bacterial or viral, I'm not going to do anything, then probably they don't need this test. So that argues, should a broad syndromic panel be the standard operative procedure test for your lab? And I'm going to suggest the answer is no, that there should be an algorithm. Some other things to consider. Is your turnaround time going to be fast enough to influence care decisions? Does the test you're looking at require batching that slows your turnaround time down versus random access? Um, is your lab going to have enough instrument to absorb flux if you have clusters of diarrhea? Furthermore, do you have a centralized laboratory? Are there going to be transport delays that are going to cause your turnaround time to suffer? If you have a positive test result, could that stop adjunct testing being ordered? If that's the case, maybe that'll reduce some of the waste in the laboratory on further unnecessary testing. That's a discussion that has to be modeled in your laboratory. And there's been a recent focus on, you know, the excellent patient experience in healthcare, where running a test and giving a patient an answer equates to an excellent physician's office experience. And that's becoming a metric where healthcare is measured by. However, there's caveats to that. If the test is negative and the patient gets a $500 bill, is that an excellent experience? Conversely, if a target's detected, but the physician had no intention of doing anything with it, and the bill is still there for $500, is that an excellent experience? And so I think that depends on the cost of the reimbursement. So along the lines of reimbursement, um, who's going to pay for this? In the outpatient setting, it's really not clear. In the inpatient setting, the payments have been a little bit more standardized. So is the lab going to absorb these expenses that don't get reimbursed? Uh, what if public health says you have to still maintain cultures so that we can identify outbreaks and they mandate it through legislation? Is that still cost effective for the lab? The CPT codes for this were just released toward the end of 2015 and it's based on the number of targets you're testing for. Uh, the rates are not clearly re-established at this point and that's likely because the average reimbursement has been all over the board. The take home points from this content is that GI infections are one of the most common infections in the United States. Uh, they generally rank uh, in many situations just behind respiratory infections. They are uh, extremely challenging in places where rehydration is not attainable. However, in the United States, that's generally not a concern. So we have these new technologies, multiplex molecular tests, and they can positively impact the patients, 
because you can potentially get actionable results that can help the patient recover. They can help the laboratories by streamlining uh, workflow. They can help public health and safety by detecting outbreaks with better sensitivity and faster. And where we're at now is trying to see the forest through the trees. There are multiple commercial tests available. Most of them very compatible, uh, sorry, very comparable. I'm going to do it again. There are multiple commercial tests available. Uh, there's lots of formats. The analytical characteristics are very comparable. Uh, they really differ on turnaround time and throughput. The cost can be a significant barrier, both for reimbursement and the laboratory. Think carefully about how the lab and the hospital are going to incorporate this, how it's going to fit in the workflow and in the ordering process. And the laboratory has to be involved in utilization efforts and stewardship to make sure that physicians use these tools correctly and appropriately.